Dear ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> distinguished speakers and guests from all around Europe and the world, welcome to the launch event of the new ERT strategy. An event under the Portuguese presidency of the Council and the ERT Stakeholders Forum, co-organized by my team here in the beautiful city of Braga, Portugal, the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory and the EIT. My name is Lars Montelius. I'm the Director General of INL. INL is an intergovernmental organization headquartered here in Braga, being an interdisciplinary organization with roughly 400 people from about 40 different countries working here. Today, we celebrate the new seven-year strategy of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. It is an exciting day for the ERT community, but also for all of us working on the front line of EU's research and innovation endeavors. The EAT has been supporting students, innovators, and entrepreneurs in every step of the journey for more than a decade now. The EAT's approach is really unique. It focuses on ecosystem building by uniting business, research, and education in knowledge and innovation communities, the well-known EAT Kicks. In the next hours, you will hear from our prominent speakers, experts, and EIT representatives how the Institute, as part of Horizon Europe, will continue improving the daily lives of millions of people here in Europe and beyond by helping to solve some of our biggest societal challenges. In concrete numbers, by 2027, the EIT is aiming to support 700 additional startups, involve over 25,000 students in its educational activities, help launch 4,000 innovative products and services on the market, involve nearly 700 higher education institutions in its activities, and boost the number of its partners from less innovative regions by 100%. Before we kick off this event, I want to invite you to participate actively in today's discussion. Use the chat and the Q&A parts of the meeting to share your views and raise questions for our speakers. Without further ado, I pass now the floor to the President of the European Parliament, Mr. David Sassoli, who has a special message for all of us here today. Buongiorno a tutti, desidero ringraziare Gioia Ghezzi, Martin Kern per il gentile invito, saluto la commissaria Gabriel, il ministro Eitor e tutti gli ospiti presenti a questo importante evento. La pandemia Covid-19 ha avuto un impatto devastante sui nostri modelli economici, sociali, sulle vite dei cittadini, ma allo stesso tempo ci ha permesso di ripensare alle nostre priorità, di guardare alla contemporaneità con uno sguardo nuovo. In questo periodo abbiamo capito l'importanza di avere sistemi resilienti, la necessità di adottare approcci multilaterali e comuni per affrontare le sfide del, dei nostri innovazioni, dal lavoro dei nostri ricercatori agli studenti eh, con qualità e talento. Oggi abbiamo le risorse, voi giocate nell'affrontare le sfide future. Il vostro approccio dal basso verso l'alto permette una cooperazione proficua tra individui, tra paesi e tra centri di ricerca. Il vostro istituto ha contribuito a creare dei veri e propri centri che hanno permesso agli europei di condividere esperienze in termini di imprenditorialità e di innovazione. E in particolare siamo molto soddisfatti per la creazione di due nuove comunità della conoscenza e dell'innovazione. Come sappiamo il settore culturale e le industrie creative hanno sofferto particolarmente durante questa crisi. Adesso che stiamo preparando la nostra ripresa dobbiamo garantire loro il giusto spazio e delle condizioni adeguate per la ricostruzione. L'alto potenziale del patrimonio culturale europeo. In termini di innovazione e sviluppo economico troppo spesso non sfruttato e questo non è più accettabile. La ricerca scientifica e l'innovazione sono il cuore dello sviluppo economico e naturalmente dobbiamo assicurare gli strumenti adeguati a coloro che operano in questi ambiti. 
Per questo ora più che mai l'Istituto Europeo di Innovazione e Tecnologia con la, nuova, la sua nuova strategia sarà uno dei motori del progresso per la creazione di veri e propri ecosistemi innovativi che colleghino le nostre menti e sostengano e ci sostengano lungo tutto il percorso. Istruzione, imprenditorialità, innovazione sono le chiavi per avere successo e per costruire un futuro migliore per le prossime generazioni. Signore e signori, per più di 20 anni il Parlamento europeo ha difeso un'ambiziosa politica per la ricerca europea. Ha sostenuto la necessità di un aumento dei bilanci globali con l'obiettivo di rafforzare la competitività. Oggi, in un momento in cui stiamo per lasciarci alle spalle la crisi, riaffermiamo questo nostro impegno. Un impegno al vostro fianco per un'Europa che non lascia indietro nessuno, che affronti le sfide economiche, digitali e sociali, creando opportunità, nuove opportunità significative per le nostre società e per i nostri cittadini. Vi auguro eh, buon lavoro, spero naturalmente di incontrarvi pre al più presto, anche di presenza, appena questo tempo così difficile lo permetterà. So thank you to uh, David for this inspiring message. So today in the morning we have three panels. The first panel is EAT for a strong and resilient Europe, and we will have three distinguished guests in that panel. The second panel will be the panel denoted strong basis and reinforced mandate. And then the third final panel for this morning will be panel three, a vision for the future stepping up. All panels will have distinguished guests and speakers, of course. And in the first panel, I'm very happy now to introduce the first three speakers. The first one out is uh, Manuel Hayter, the Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Education of Portugal. Very welcome, Manuel. And then we have Maria de Graça Cavallo, member of the European Parliament. Very welcome to you also. And Maria Gabriel, European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth. Very welcome to you as well. So, I just give a very, very short introduction, although you are well known, but the Maeve, we have a lot of people looking at us up today. So, Mr. Hector has been the Portugal's Minister for Science, Technology and Higher Education since November 2015. During 2005 to 2011, he served as Secretary of State for Science, Technology and Higher Education. He is also a professor at the Instituto Superior Tecnico, Lisbon, with a PhD from Imperial College London in Mechanical Engineering. And back in 1998, he founded the Center for Studies in Innovation, Technology and Development Policies at the Institute in Lisbon. Maria Delgaza Cavallo is a member of the European Parliament and EPP Vice Coordinator in the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy. She showed twice as Minister for Science and Higher Education in Portugal and was an advisor to the European Commissioner for Research and Innovation, Carlos Mueras, and European Commission President Barroso. She also served as a member of the European Parliament between July 2009 and May 2014. Dr. Cavallo received a PhD in Energy Intensive Industries from Imperial College in London. And then Maria Gabriel, European Commissioner. Maria Gabriel is the current European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth. Since November 2019, she has been Vice President of the European People's Party, EPP. She was the European Commissioner for Digital Economy and society during 2017 to 2019, and the vice president of the EPP group in the European Parliament during 2014 to 2017. Maria was a member of the European Parliament from 2009 to 2017. She is on project teams for the digital signal market, any union, budget and human resources, and jobs, growth, investment, and competitiveness. So to all three of you, very, very welcome. So I would like to start by uh, introducing to the Minister Hater a question. Um, just a second. Can I help you with the question, Lars? Yeah, <laughs> it seems so. <laughs> I seem so. I didn't find, I don't find it here in my note now. 
let me see where is it ah here here sorry so minister hater this is the last month of the portuguese presidency and if i could make a personal observation i would say that you have been extremely active on all issues regarding research and innovation you have experienced firsthand the disparities between both member states and regions in terms of research and innovation in your opinion how important is it to make sure that innovation capacities are as balanced as possible and what role do you see for the ERT in this? Uh, last, thank you very much and let me acknowledge and uh, give a, a great good morning and applause to Maria Gabriela, our Commissioner and Graça Carvalho, member of the European Parliament, that both of them have been so involved uh, in this overall fight. At the end of the day, we all know very well that uh, science is a battleground and uh, we look forward for a very inclusive EIT, inclusive in the way that in any knowledge-driven economy, we know very well, and I'm sure in this audience, that it is driven by people. And we have excellent people throughout Europe. And so the ultimate goal should always not to leave no one behind and to bring to the center of attention um, and to, to the center of these debates all those that have the, the, the talent to contribute. And we know that there are talented people in all European regions. And therefore, opening up the European Institute of Technology to address um, research excellence in every single European region should be a pathway to follow in the years uh, to come. Certainly, the knowledge integrated communities, which have been developed over the years, has enlarged, but still are very much concentrated in a few European regions, and therefore, the battleground will be always open access to excellence to everyone. Certainly, the two new kicks on um, um, ocean related research and creative industries open up to new research areas, but more and more the inclusiveness of Europe and developing a what I would call a citizen approach, research-driven approach to the future of Europe will need to be always an inclusive way. And therefore, we believe that the changes which have been made in the regulatory framework of, of EIT will help, will help open up and towards always an inclusive research excellent strategy throughout Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, then a question for uh, for the second speaker, uh, Mr. Mrs. Cavallo, Dr. Cavallo. Uh, for those uh, who of us working in the field of research and innovation, you certainly need no introduction. For years now, you have been one of the strongest advocates of the importance of research and innovation in every area of our lives. Having played such a critical role in getting the ERT ready for Rise of Europe as the rapporteur for its strategic and innovation agenda, please share with us your thoughts on the ERT journey so far and the challenges it should be taking on in the future. Please. Good morning, Lars. I hope that you are hearing me well. First, I would like to say good morning also to Commissioner Maria Gabriel and to Minister Tor and to take the opportunity to thank by, by, for the good collaboration, uh, both in the EIT and now in the partnerships that we are working very hard, that uh, in certain way uh, also related uh, fields. Um, as you have said, I have a strong uh, link with the EIT. I have started to work in the EIT before it exists. It was my first job when I started working with the, uh, President Barroso to design the EIT, to design such a, a different uh, uh, instrument and the knowledge for innovation uh, communities. And in my first term in the European Parliament from 2009 to 2014, I create with the Commission of Brazil at the time, the, and I share the friends for EIT, uh, because the EIT had a difficult start and we were able to, to make the EIT like per, by everyone with a, with a lot of effort in the beginning. And I'm very proud. So I'm very happy that now I was uh, the rapporteur of the strategic innovation uh, agenda. And the EIT, as I said, with the difficult beginning is now a very successful instrument. They have 
uh, it has very good results in terms of postdoctoral uh, students, um, has trained highly qualified researchers, has turned ideas into business, uh, has developed and uh, created a lot of startups and uh, innovative companies. So it's really a successful story. Uh, there is no doubt that the EIT will uh, grow in importance in these uh, objectives of the green and digital transitions. However, there are some challenges that uh, the EIT has uh, to face. Uh, Minister Ritor has already mentioned some. Uh, and I have addressed that in the in my report on the strategic and innovation agenda. And the first one I will say it needs a more balanced approach, more balanced in terms of geographical distribution. Uh, EIT until now has been very concentrated in uh, mainly in five uh, countries. So we really need to make an effort to have a more balanced uh, distribution of the results of EIT. More gender balance because it's very dominated by men in the uh, at all levels so we, we really need keeping excellence but we need to make an effort for a gender balance and i also advocate to have a more balance in the in the knowledge triangle so a more emphasis to the higher education because i think that in the uh, last few years there has been a, a strong emphasis on innovation that is very good but it has to have a balanced approach with the three parts of the knowledge triangle research innovation and education second feature is the regional dimension that we have stressed a lot in our uh, in our report uh, with the, the regional innovation scheme to have a binding uh, budget and the synergies with other funds, with other funds inside Horizon Europe, but also with the Recovery and Resilience Plan, also with other funds, European funds, national, public and private funds. And thirdly, very important, more open, more transparent, more visibility with the open calls, transparent calls, because it's not always the case. It's very important. The fourth is the simplification. We want a more flexible, uh, more simplification, less red tape uh, in the EIT. And lastly, uh, as was also mentioned by Minister Itur, um, the new area. We are opening up to new areas. One of them that is already on the on the way that is very very important for for Europe is in the center of the European project that is culture and creative sector and has suffered a lot with the with the crisis and the second area that we have created also very important for all over Europe is water quality of water the availability of water but also the ocean that is so important for Europe not only for the ones that the countries that are near the ocean but for all over Europe but the, in particular to my own country that we are very linked to oceans I am very happy that we managed to launch a, a kick uh, on water so a lot of challenge for the EIT in the near future thank you very much and then to Commissioner Gabriel, uh, you praised many times the European scientists and innovators for the work and determination towards developing rapid response to the crisis. EIT is a stellar example of your portfolio to that end, as it was the only EU instrument that responded to applicants of its crisis response initiative call in the record time of two weeks. Could you share with us your thoughts on how you see the role of EIT within the overall EU research and innovation landscape in 2021 and beyond? In other words, in what way is the EIT unique and how will it complement the other EU instruments? Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. First of all, I would like to say a big thank you to Minister Hater and to Maria Graça Carvalho for their extraordinary support extraordinary cooperation and extraordinary engagement in favor of innovation and EIT. So uh, I would like to start by saying that we have to seize real momentum because now uh, everywhere in all our member states, we see that there will be an extraordinary level of investment and we would like here to face some of the main challenges for our economy and society. But 
Like any profound change, this transformation will be driven by talented and motivated individuals, men and women from across the EU. And that's why first I count on EIT to equip these change makers, students, researchers, innovators with the skills and mindset to unlock their potential. Because immediately after, now we have a real ambition to ensure that European Union becomes the global powerhouse for startups. And that's why we need to build a true pan-European innovation ecosystem. Who, who else that EIT can be a driver for this? Because yes, EIT will play an, a key role in building this pan-European innovation ecosystem because the ecosystem approach is in the DNA of the EIT since its creation in 2008 and has proven to be the most successful way of fostering innovation. Because you mentioned it at the beginning through its kicks the EIT has managed to create the largest network of innovation partners across Europe, more than 2,400. And that's why articulating local innovation ecosystems in a pan-European innovation ecosystem is particularly relevant when we want to reduce the innovation gap between countries or regions, including rural areas. And they have really, as Maria Grassa said too, great expectations in the reinforced regional innovation scheme in this regard. Another important aspect that I would like to highlight from the EIT is its emphasis on the individuals behind innovations. Because we have so many, so many amazing success stories of innovators who, after having been through an EIT education and training program, went to achieve outstanding commitments take the yearly Forbes 30 under 30 list. It is a clear testimony of the EIT's capacity to identify talents and to unlock their potential. The same, we have so many innovators that now are founders of unicorns, like the flying taxi Lilium or battery manufacturers such as Northvolt and Skeleton. And EIT is the first and only European program that has been able to support some of the existing unicorns in European Union. And I'm really very confident that EIT will continue with this amazing track record in this new period. Last, with synergies with what we have as the opportunities at this moment, that's the, these are the game changers. So now back to some other questions. So Minister Hato, aside from your political career, you have an, ex an extensive academic experience. And drawing on your experience on higher education, what two things would you change to help boost the place of research and innovation in the minds of young Europeans? Lars, thank you very much for the, the question. If you ask for two things, I will certainly vote, first of all, for what the European University Association has called the University Without Walls, and therefore promoting more and more a citizen-driven, say, research-based approach to higher education, which certainly requires what Graça Carvalho mentioned about the triangulation of knowledge education, research and innovation, which certainly is a challenge for all over Europe in terms of certainly the enlargement of the social support for higher education, because um, about in average 40% of European citizens between 30 and 34 years old, um, old, old um, uh, higher education degree and our target should move to 50% by 2030. But we know that this enlargement do require a clear movement towards diversification and specialization. And this can only be done with more research and innovation. The second point, which has become actually the center of the debates and of the conclusions adopted by the Council on the 28th of May, 
during the Portuguese presidency with the strong support of the Commission, but very consensual among all member states, is the key question of research careers. Because overall, Europe needs more scientists and these do require certainly improving research careers and above all, above all, um, providing um, access for young researchers to research careers. We certainly compete worldwide um, in, in an increasingly um, um, issue for uh, the, um, skilled human resources, particularly research skills. And this can only be, um, or we can only face this challenge by improving research careers, certainly, certainly, higher education institutions and universities in particular do play a, critic, a, a critical role in this process of improving research careers, certainly in addition in complement and in, in, in articulation with scientific institutions. And again, these two issues, first, the university without walls, second, the career and the access to research careers for young researchers, need to be fully uh, integrated in the uh, university, European University Alliances. Actually, again, on the 19th of May, the, the Education Council adopts um, conclusions on the way or the pathway towards improving and strengthening um, the European education area through um, European University Alliances as a way to create really test beds for good practices in terms of the integration of agri-education, research and innovation, but also of research careers, particularly assuming a stepwise process for joint recruitment and again, um, be guaranteed that Europe at large attracts talent and provides the necessary and adequate conditions at an international terms for research careers, because that is the, the, the best we can do throughout Europe. And certainly we need to lead this twin transition of, uh, making use of the opportunities of the increasing digitalization of our uh, societies to face the challenge of the, the greening of our economy. And certainly this can only be done with, a, with an Europe which is more resilient, is more social, is certainly open and is global. But this will be driven certainly in a research-based approach to in close articulation with agri-education institutions. So therefore, the two main topics is the openness of agri-education in one way. And second is the need to further improve the development of research in education careers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these very thoughtful ideas. So to Dr. Carvalho, the EAT's vision is to become the leading European initiative that empowers innovators and entrepreneurs to develop world-class solutions to societal challenges. As a true connoisseur of the EAT, what are the unique elements that help it stand out and deliver for Europe's innovators? Thank you very much, Lars. I, I fully agree with uh, everything that uh, already Commissioner Maria Gabriel has said, uh, but uh, I will stress uh, five elements as unique elements of the, the EAT. Uh, first, as uh, has been said, the triangle of knowledge is still the, the only instrument, the EU instrument, covering the, the, the three components. Uh, second, uh, the long time perspective. There is no other instrument that goes up 15 years, and that is important. The, the stability that it brings, uh, it's a, a very important element. Third, is has a very direct link between the global and the European level and the regional and the local level. And that is very interesting because it's like the, the uh, a very good link between the research and the higher education and the innovation that can be considered a bit more local and more, more regional. So this is a, a unique feature. It does it in a very well and very well sought the, the way is linked to the, the European level with the, the local uh, level. Fourth, 
uh, it's an instrument that address uh, the fundamental questions for life of, the, of us and of the planet, of the people and the planet. Is water, uh, uh, quality of air, the environment, and the climate change, the energy, the food, the health. So, uh, and really, I'm happy that water has uh, uh, joined this uh, because it, it addressed the, the sustainable development goals and the key issues important for uh, people and for the, the planet. And, and finally, is uh, the model of collaboration is still a very unique model because. It's like an hybrid model. You have the network, but you have the collocation centers. And it's a very interest model because you you collaborate uh, at the distance in networks, in the, but you also uh, recognize that you need the physical contact, you need to, to interact. Uh, and the collocation centers are also a very, uh, a very interesting concept. And I think that all that together is a model uh, that others, other institutions, even not funded by the EIT, should follow in the future because it's really a well designed way to promote higher education research and innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, to Commissioner Gabriel, uh, it will not be an understatement to say that throughout your political path you have been one of the most vocal and dedicated supporters of young and female entrepreneurial empowerment. You have truly given voice to the new generation of innovators and you are actively pushing the diversity agenda in the entrepreneurial field. Thank you very much for doing that. Women have, have, have been hit by, harder by the pandemic as investors seem to show less confidence in female-led endeavors. Have you seen progress on that front? And what are your plans to tackle this issue in the near future? Well, thank you very much, Lars, for this question. Uh, as I already said, it, I think that one of the most important thing is to give voice to this new generation of innovators. And we can't think about the European leadership in innovation without women entrepreneurship, without all these extraordinary talented women in the field of innovation. So yes, it's true that uh, first, well before the pandemic, the representation of women founders in the startup community was very low, with women founders representing less than 3% of the founders of the European startups. And it's true that the pandemic has somehow exacerbated this situation. However, however, we should know that the situation across Europe is very different, with, for example, Central and Eastern Europe having the largest amount of female founders of startups in the tech community as, as of the end of 2020. It's true that we have made some progresses over the years, but we are not there yet because while we have actually 48% of the PhD graduates that, that are female, only 33% of researchers are women, and women occupy only 17% of tech sector jobs and hold less than 10% of patents. So we definitely need to change something. We need more women in STEM, more women researchers, more women innovators. And that's why for me, EIT has a very important role to play. First, I think that we should continue to give more visibility to all these role models, success stories that will inspire young girls. Yes, EIT runs the EIT Women Awards, and I must say that we have our European Women Innovators Prize, so we should continue to, to, to give them visibility in order to inspire other young girls to engage in this, in this path. The second is always to make this link with education because we know that more than 90% of girls uh, in primary and secondary school are interested on innovation, on information and communication technologies, but something happened after the university with 
thousand graduates, we have only 24 women in ICT and only six are making career. So we need to do something. And that's why here EIT has an extraordinary experience with the, this knowledge triangle where we can promote and we can support more women and girls in this path pathway. The third element for me is to build networks. We need here to give voice to all these extraordinary and talented women. Remember when I started this work of a European pan, in, 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 pan European innovation ecosystem, I created the group of 32, 33 European unicorns, the group of the innovation ecosystems leaders, and the group of women venture capital fund managers. And this group is dedicated exclusively to women exactly because we need to address all these issues. Now, I think that we have some other good news. You know that as of 22, all public bodies, higher education institutions and research organizations wishing to participate in Horizon Europe will be required to have a gender equality plan in place. Also the integration of the gender dimension into research and innovation content becomes a requirement by default across the whole program. And I think that we can use this incentive to be accompanied by concrete initiatives as we have with EIT and the training for 40,000 girls in artificial intelligence and big data in order to accelerate this, this process. Finally, our last initiative, Women Tech EU, we decided really to invest in women-led companies in the deep tech uh, and for that I'm sure that we'll have a lot of success stories that will inspire others. So if I have to resume, giving, give more visibility to all already all the talented and successful women. Make a huge and very concrete link with education where we can intervene in order not only to inspire, but to support. And third, build networks between the different women innovators and entrepreneurs or women leaders in order not only to talk about this issue, but to act. So I think that here you have my, they all know that they have my full support. Now I count on them for more success stories, for more examples, because that's above all this, this, their strength, the example. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel. And uh, with th these words, the first panel now about the strong, resilient Europe has been addressed by our three prominent guest speakers in this first panel. And uh, I think the message is clear that the EIT is here to support for a really strong and resilient Europe. And we will put the focus on, I would say, the game changes that we are needing. And I think the women is a very important part of that. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit proud of INL because we have 50% women and and male scientists at INL and 50% of our innovators starting companies are female. So it's it good from that perspective, but there are much more things needed to be done, of course, but I think we're on a very good track. So I would like to thank you all very much. And then I will introduce the next panel, the second panel of today. So thank you again for your contribution. Thank you. And now we go to the second panel. It's a strong basis and reinforced mandate. And I will start to introduce the, the, uh, the, the chairman of this panel, which is uh, the chair of the EIT governing board, Goya Getsi, who is the, uh, who will host this session. So just to say a few words about Goya Getsi before, uh, Goya has been chairwoman of the EIT governing board since 2020. She's also chair of the RDI group, of course, at Capital, and chair of the nomination committee of Atlantia, Edizioni Holding, and vice president of Aso Lombarda IT. She previously worked as CEO of International Group Risk Solutions for the Zurich Insurance Group, 2030 to 2016, and COO for the Willis Group between 2012 to 2013, and spent over 11 years at McKinsey and Company as a partner in the London office. Joya obtained a degree in theoretical physics from the University of Milan and an MBA from the London Business School. 
So very welcome to the panel and to host this panel. I will start uh, there you are with, this, with the first question. So it has been one year since you appointed as chair of the EAT governing board, a challenging one, no doubt, due to the ne negotiations of the new EAT strategy, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic situation. But it was also an exciting one as the outcome of these negotiations found EAT with a stronger mandate and increased budget. So early on the decision making talked about the challenges EAT will be tackled in the years to come. So what is your vision and ambition for the EAT in the near future? Please. Thank you very um, much indeed, uh, uh, Lars, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, chairing and organizing this uh, day. I think uh, a, a lot uh, of uh, observations uh, on uh, the EIT history and its future have been made uh, by the distinguished uh, uh, panel of speakers uh, before us. So I'll just uh, be uh, uh, very, very quick and um, discuss the pr priorities that we have as a board taking over, as you say, after such uh, an intense uh, uh, period. You know, and, and I would say there are uh, three priorities, uh, uh, really. The first one is to continue to support uh, a unique innovation ecosystem across the whole of Europe. The second one is uh, uh, be uh, a part that becomes more and more indispensable and the partner in responding to the current challenge of recovering across Europe uh, from the pandemic and to the future challenges uh, uh, that uh, uh, we are facing. Uh, the climate change one, uh, uh, you know, first and foremost. And finally, the um, third priority we have is that of creating particularly a research and innovation ecosystem that leaves no one behind. As uh, Minister Hator said, uh, no one behind in terms of different regions across uh, Europe. As um, Commissioner Gabriel said, uh, no one uh, behind uh, in terms, for example, of uh, um, gender. So let me take them very, very briefly um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, turn. So on uh, a unique uh, European innovation ecosystem, I think, uh, as MP Carvalho said, that uh, the EIT had, uh, you know, a hard start and uh, needed to find its way. We are 10 years on um, from, uh, from its start and now it's a really proven, you know, tried, tested, proven way of uh, fostering innovation by bringing together what we call the innovation triangle, education, research, uh, uh, business, and, and finance, and capital. So we need to continue to do that. We need to continue to attract innovators, investors, entrepreneurs, and foster that. In terms of the second priority, becoming an indispensable partner, I think as Europe tackles, um, the pandemic, uh, climate change, the Green Deal, uh, uh, the digitalization of, uh, of Europe, we do have the competencies, the partner networks. Uh, again, as was said before, these are both virtual and physical, and really uh, we can play a part and have already been playing a part actually in becoming this sparring partner, the first contact point um, to change things uh, uh, rapidly across uh, Europe. And finally, on leaving um, no one behind, we really believe in place-based innovation, in creating communities that, as well as virtual, are uh, physical, where, you know, through contact, through inter interdisciplinary discussion, um, there can be uh, that spark that brings uh, uh, new ideas, uh, 
uh, to you know to to deliver in terms of uh, um, innovation. So I think by having a more inclusive approach, opening up the partnerships uh, again, as was said uh, earlier, really paying attention to leaving no one behind, and. Uh, Again, Commissioner Gabriel said it very, very well. Yes, we can inspire people, but we must actively, very proactively support them. So we must support countries where there is an innovation gap. We must support uh, uh, women and uh, innovators in general who do not benefit from uh, um, a very uh, good uh, um, ecosystem in uh, uh, coming to the fore. So these are and remain uh, our uh, priorities. But rather than me um, speaking about this, uh, I want uh, um, to um, uh, uh, discuss with uh, um, two founders of uh, um, uh, companies who are uh, with us uh, uh, today, Peter, and uh, um, Arne, and uh, um, invite them uh, um, to talk uh, uh, about uh, their companies and uh, how um, uh, the EIT helped them get uh, to where they are. So perhaps uh, we can start uh, with uh, Peter and uh, Northfold. Peter, you are on mute. Yes, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, so so we, we've been, uh, uh, you know, we've been working with with two different uh, parts of of EIT, EIT raw materials, and we've been working with Inno Energy, uh, and I think we have had uh, uh, really really good experience uh, with uh, with uh, both these. Um, the, the, the projects that we have evolved uh, uh, has been, you know, very defined. They've been hands-on and they've been um, uh, um, been um, very supportive to us in, in a time where uh, maybe there was more difficult uh, difficulties uh, in, 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 in just finding that the, the generic uh, uh, capital in, in, in early stages of, of uh, uh, key development. Um, I, I must also say that, that uh, the support of the EIT organization in order to, to understand um, um, the, the European EU uh, governance structure and, and how um, uh, you know, to understand what is on the agenda uh, in the uh, in the EU structure, but also how to uh, how to get to the right uh, um, uh, stakeholders uh, within uh, the uh, the EU government organization. Uh, we have had instrumental help from from. Uh, uh, from, from the the EIT uh, or organization, and it's been uh, it's been super uh, important for us uh, uh, with with that. Uh, uh, also, when it comes to to understand how to be able to impact policy and and other things that will pave way for for new innovation and 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 uh, new startups. So our experience have been uh, um, extraordinarily good uh, overall. Thank you, Peter. And uh, Arner, you, you co-founded uh, Clinomics. Uh, uh, tell us a bit uh, also about uh, the company and again, uh, which role the EIT played in supporting you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. My name is Arne Peine. Um, I am a medical doctor by training, uh, intensivist, and uh, also uh, one of the co-founders of the startup Clinomic. We uh, develop uh, medical products, in particular uh, a smart assistance system for the intensive care unit, something that is very important, uh, in particular in these times. Uh, you can see uh, the device behind me. And uh, I would uh, say, I mean, we are more or less a direct success of the uh, EIT health ecosystem. Uh, so we have uh, started as an innovation 
development project um, uh, approximately one and a half years ago and uh, since then received an enormous support in all kinds of different areas, uh, starting from financial support that is uh, very important, but also all different areas like mentorship, access to uh, different European uh, markets, um, uh, introduction to uh, regulatory experts, and also, as, as Peter kindly uh, mentioned, um, also to understand the European, um, yeah, I would say, uh, ecosystem of, of different stakeholders of how to access those markets. And in this particular, uh, the EIT Health has been extremely supportive. And uh, we are, um, I can safely say, we, we would not be here without the support of the EIT Health uh, ecosystem, both in a uh, financial direction, but also in like mentoring, guiding you through the uh, uh, through the sea of, of different um, uh, areas in particular, also um, managing of how to introduce a medical product very fast within just 18 months to the European market. And the EIT Health has been immensely uh, supportive in this regard. And um, I can safely say without them, we wouldn't be here. Thank you, Arne. Maybe you can give us um, a, a concrete example of how the EIT ecosystem really supported you, perhaps especially in the beginning. Now you are already a quite successful company. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, to be to be honest, uh, I mean, the first prototype that we built uh, was uh, basically the result of an EIT health project. And uh, we used that prototype to to gather uh, um, further fundings. We have since then acquired over 8 million in venture capital money, a lot of um, uh, third party grants as well. And, and uh, to build this, to enable really uh, to build a, a prototype from an idea of six people, basically academics uh, who, who worked in, in the field and, and then started a company, this would not have been possible without the support of EIT Health. But also um, the involvement of all kinds of different stakeholders as we are building a high-risk product. I mean, it is a medical device, which is not easy, um, first of all, to manufacture, uh, then also to bring it to the market, to get through the regulatory barriers. All of this has been immensely supported. And then maybe the, the, the most important thing for us is also um, to get connections to all kinds of different countries where we are serving, uh, uh, that we are serving currently and that we are shipping our devices to. We have over eight European countries with very different markets and uh, to get direct access to uh, decision makers, to stakeholders um, in these countries and to understand how are they uh, uh, living uh, basically uh, um, the intensive care unit and how, how do they use our devices. This has been um, a very, very uh, fruitful um, since the beginning also to get this access uh, early on, um, to get feedback very early on, because um, as we come from a German perspective, uh, sometimes the European perspective is, is a little different. And uh, I, I guess one of the main pillars of our success is in the end to have a product that works very broadly throughout the European market. And, and I can safely say all these connections through the network, we, um, we, we would never have been able to acquire by ourselves. Um, hence, I would uh, uh, say uh, this is really of how the uh, innovation from a small startup to a medium-sized company, we are now over 50 people, how, how this should work in the, uh, in the European field. Thank you very much, Arne. And um, Peter, uh, Northvolt has been, um, you know, such a successful story uh, uh, up to now. Mm -hmm. um, what are the challenges that you see as you grow so fast? <laughs> it's a lot of challenges. Uh, yeah, yeah, just to, to, to recollect, I mean, um, we started four, four years ago and uh, and and we are now roughly 1700 people we are recruiting uh, about 100 people uh, per per month and and uh, um uh, obviously with that comes a, a number of different uh, uh, different challenges the, the the great thing is is that we are kind of in the midst of a perfect storm uh, you know 
the, the, the Green Deal and uh, the, the COVID and, and has, has actually pushed an, 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 uh, an electrification and, and a transformation even faster. So, so on, the, on the demand side, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a, an incredibly strong uh, uh, picture. Uh, on uh, also over the last couple of years, a lot with the help also of, of for, uh, for, from, the, uh, uh, for, from the EU on utilizing EIB as, 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 a, as a strong uh, uh, tool for, for, for financing and funding. Uh, I think it, that, you know, the finance now for for new investments in in this field has has strongly strongly improved uh, the biggest challenges uh, uh, here that we see is is on competence in our field there is a, a fairly uh, limited skill uh, both when it comes to uh, battery uh, cell design and and also on on manufacturability so so uh, we are uh, we are being challenged on on on, and I think uh, one of the the biggest limitations going forward for the growth of this industry will be how fast Europe can convert and and train everything from from high level engineering to 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 operators uh, uh, supporting this this industry. And I do know that that the, uh, Inno Energy and and part is part of building a curriculum for that, but it's going to need massive massive amounts. Of of of, uh, uh, of support for that. The second part is is around the supply chains. You know there is a, there is a number of different uh, 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 now uh, initiatives around factories uh, that is 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 being built. Uh, we are uh, you know building our first major factory. We're actually building a second in in Gdansk, and we're looking at the third and the fourth factory. Uh, but but there is a um, there is a, a strong lack of, of build up supply chain when it comes to raw materials, when it comes to to key components, when it comes to to equipment, uh, uh, automation support, etc. In in Europe, it's a lot concentrated to to Asia, and for long term competitiveness in 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 Europe, it's it's going to be super important uh, to to drive this. In in, in all different uh, aspects. And here, I think the EIT uh, really has a, a, an important role to play. Thank you. We hope we will. Maybe we need to set up um, oven factories for your batteries in Europe. Exactly, exactly. But uh, Peter, if you had, um, you know, I think we have at the moment and also in the next few days, uh, a lot of young entrepreneurs uh, who will look at this uh, recording. If you had uh, uh, one tip to give them, you know, I, I look back at uh, your younger self when you made your jump uh, to become an entrepreneur, what, uh, what would be the one tip you would give them? I, I mean, I, what, what I would say is, is you know, really, um, you know, try to solve a big problem, um, you know. <laughs> Uh, I think this is uh, uh, this is important. It's also very very important, uh, and and there is an immense power in 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 uh, in building a mission driven organization that is trying to solve a big a big, uh, a, a big uh, problem. And then don't limit yourself towards, uh, you know, trying to find uh, uh, competence in in your local labor market. But, but think big also when it comes to attracting key, uh, key competence. Because if you want to build something world-class, then you need to look for the best people wherever you can find them. I fully agree. And Arne, what is your tip? I mean, I, I can only underline uh, the points that Peter has already said. I mean, to to really see uh, the European Union as a resource for uh, also acquiring the top talent uh, throughout the continent, it's extremely uh, important for us. But uh, I would add uh, an additional point that is uh, involve stakeholders as soon as possible. Uh, so 
uh, we summarize this often under the point fail fast. And, and that is something uh, that, that I can see in, in many uh, uh, smaller companies nowadays um, that they do not involve the potential customers since the very beginning. And it is a painful process uh, in the beginning to, to, you are very proud of your product, you bring it to them and then they just say, okay, uh, this is not what we wanted, but it, it basically gives you uh, the opportunity to uh, reevaluate what you have been doing and it gives you a way more um, uh, yeah, competence in the end to decide whether you are following a good strategy. So ask for feedback uncomfortably early in the process. So uh, ask them, do you want that product and involve experts of the specific domain that you are working in? I guess that's, that's a, one of the major successes um, uh, and the major points that, that lead to success in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, I'll uh, hand back uh, to Lars now. Thank you so much, Joffi. So now we're going to the third panel, and this is the panel about a vision for the future stepping up. This panel will be led by, by, uh, by Martin, the new director for Martin Kern, the new director, or not new, the EIT director uh, that will host this panel. Uh, Martin, your journey at the EIT began already in 2014. Back then you were asked to lead a small team in EIT's headquarters in Budapest and managed three kicks. You have clearly come along, and I may say, very successful way, since while the EIT team remains small, the EIT community has grown to eight kicks soon to be nine, and EIT has today an extensive network of partners. That is impressive without doubt. And now, looking forward, how do you plan to deliver on the newly received 7 year mandate by the EU institutions and vision that Joya talked about? From a more personal perspective, how does this new seven year period make you feel as the EIT director? Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lars. And first of all, good morning to all participants who are interested in the future strategy of the EIT for the next seven years. So we are happy to have you with us. And well, special thanks to President Sassoli, Minister Hator, a member of European Parliament, Caballo and Commissioner Gabriel for their very kind words, but also, of course, all the support they've given to the EIT. And it was great also to hear from, from Joya, Peter and Anne, what really are the success factors for, for EIT, but, but of course also for individual entrepreneurs and innovators that we can support. Um, so from my side, I think um, obviously the expectations are very high. <laughs> Um, as we heard in the first panels. And I think we have also created these very high expectations by being successful with uh, supporting companies such as Northwold through EIT Inno Energy. But I'm also optimistic that, that we can deliver on these expectations because we now have 10 years of experience to build upon. And we have a fantastic community with our eight knowledge and innovation communities and, and the strengths, I think, and, and why I'm optimistic is that, that we can really build on our unique features. They were already mentioned, but three of them are especially important to me, which is the focus on the societal challenges that allows to flexibly go where the innovation opportunities are. And that's what we've seen for, for, for you know, energy, for, for climate kick, for EIT digital, that uh, first kicks right from the beginning could always adjust their strategy whenever um, European priorities emerged or there were new innovation potential. So that is very key that there's always the umbrella of a clear focus and a societal challenge. Secondly, it's that we can work across all the innovation chain and that really makes the community so rich. So you have the whole funnel, you can look at the education side, the entrepreneurship, and then all the way to bringing that to the market. And thirdly, that we have this focused on making the partnerships, the ecosystems sustainable, meaning bringing successful innovations to the market is in the end of the day what EIT is about, and which is in the end of the day also which will bring the success for, for Europe, for the people, but of course also to maintain the, the innovation ecosystems. Now, there are four decisive factors for me when we look at the next seven years going forward to succeed. First of all, EIT must become better known and more open. Why is that? Because only if, if we're well known, we will attract the top talents from Europe and beyond, the best students, entrepreneurs, innovators to work with us. And that is obviously the basis for, for our success. 
Secondly, the ERT community needs to work together to really use the full diversity. There is sometimes a tendency, I think everywhere, to work in certain silos, but this is not um, where the innovation happens. The opportunities come when we work more together. That's true within the kicks, across the kicks, but even beyond, for example, with the European Innovation Council um, to make the new partnership work out um, in Horizon Europe. Thirdly, it's to remove those barriers to innovation wherever they are. They can exist between the countries. Um, example was mentioned by, by Anna, others. It's key to connect all across Europe, connections that may not naturally exist, but with the European um, Institute for Innovation and Technology can help to create those, those connections through its ecosystems. And also, of course, um, in terms of barriers, administrative barriers. So we must have flexible tool as EIT, we are accountable. It's, it's European money, it's taxpayers' money, but wherever we can, we must simplify and, and be efficient um, with a focus on the innovation to get to the market. And then lastly, obviously, in the next seven years, we must seize our new opportunities. That's especially the increased focus on the regional outreach program, the higher education initiative that we have been provided a mandate with, but also the new kicks, such as the one on culture and creativity coming up. So if we do all of that, take those opportunities, I think we will be successful going forward. Now, personally, indeed, I joined the ERT in 2014. Um, for me, a very important element that sort of accompanied my journey is the regional innovation scheme that was introduced at the same time and really was a tool to open up and, and really help to find the great ideas because they exist all over Europe and help to support them. So I'm really happy having spent a lot of my career on enlargement of the European Union, coming from the French German border region, um, seeing you know how that grows together and, and now seeing how we can work together um, all across Europe. And really um, that is true um, to do so um, within the European Union, but also with our neighbors, such as the, the Western Balkan countries. So I'm really excited with the new mandate that, that the EIT has um, in the regional innovation scheme. And that will certainly be one of the success factors. Um, so that would be it from my side. Um, and now I think I would like to invite um, Kirsten Dunlop, the CEO of EIT Climate Kick since 2017, and Susanna Sargento, the CEO of the networking company Veniam and winner of the EIT's no, EU's Women Award um, 2016. So Kirsten will represent the whole EIT community and Susanna can give us a much needed outside perspective on our new strategy, which I think is always very important that we also get an independent view on, on what we are doing. And of course, if there is one overarching theme in terms of societal challenges faced by Europe, but also humanity as a whole, it is really climate change right now. And that is actually addressed by the EIT as a whole with all the aid, knowledge and innovation communities directly or indirectly contributing to it. And it also has, of course, been moved back very centrally now that with the pandemic, at least in Europe, um, receding, um, we, we can focus fully on that, that big challenge. So Kirsten, could I invite you? I mean, you're leading EIT Climate Kick, one of the first knowledge and innovation communities of the EIT to be the voice of all the kicks today and let us know where you concretely see the biggest added value of the EIT model going forward. Thank you, Martin. Yes, indeed. I would say above all, it is in implementation of EU policy through education, innovation and entrepreneurship. We are a key part, the IT and the, the kicks, the knowledge innovation communities are a key part of the operational arm in EU policy making. We develop capability, we train new skills and mindsets. We bring new ideas to market in the form of ventures and businesses, as you've heard from the previous session. And we stay with those ventures to nurture them in place-based ecosystems and value chain-based uh, initiatives. So above all, we exist to orchestrate impact from innovation in response to some of the major societal challenges that the EU is faced with and that European policy is seeking a leadership position on and commitments to transformation. We exist to bridge gaps between innovation actors and to nourish innovators through their journey right along the way. We connect innovation and new skills to investment and to blended finance. And that's a very critical element of bringing innovation 
right to market, and making sure that change happens on the ground. And above all, uh, we operate across the whole of the EU. As you heard from Peter Carlson, one of the strengths of the EIT community is the power of a pan-European sourcing of research, of ideas, of talent, and the possibility of then making markets and placing innovations in pan-European markets. So I would say ultimately we are doers. We make things happen on the ground in partnership with cities, with regions, with businesses, with investors, and with policymakers who have the appetite to support European leadership um, and to put Europe on the market globally. Um, and that does include the extent to which, as we look forward, the new SAI encourages broader and broader and deeper increased regional development, the possibility of leapfrogging solutions and of connecting Europe to its neighbours and to some of its key institutional global partners. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, Susanna, could I ask you, as an academic and innovator, I think you're perfectly placed to give us an independent view on the perspective of the EIT's new strategy. Um, where do you see its strengths? So where do you think we can further empower EU's innovation ecosystem? And maybe also where do you see some of the challenges or possibilities to do things differently or better? Susanna. Good morning to all. It is a great pleasure to be here. So being academic and at the same time um, having the possibility to start a company and even in my academic work uh, having the possibility to, um, to do several projects uh, in the cities with the citizens, I have actually a, a, view, a view on this. So first of all, I think that bringing research and higher education to innovation is very important because it empowers innovation with new and different ideas that may seem difficult to get uh, value in entrepreneurship at first, but that can be very important in out-of-the-box innovation. And that's something that we need uh, nowadays. And the, on the other side, I think that the interrelation with academia and industry also enables the rich support of the business environment in the academia the awareness of business problems, of opportunities that can be very interesting challenges for the academia. So I think that this interrelation that I, I know that EIT is also pursuing is very, very important for innovation. And moving forward and considering the several communities, the, the knowledge communities in general, and actually some of them in particular, I think it is very important to provide the support for the research and for the innovation to be tested in the reality with real users from the start. So why not the very first stage? So also this may be and may seem easy for some areas. For example, if I think about health and manufacturing where you can um, with the, the, the people that are in the hospitals or people that are in the factories, so you can test some of the ideas. If you go to the other areas such as urban mobility, so these mobility decisions that you can make in the cities, they need to be implemented in the real places so that the effects can be assessed in real conditions. So this is very difficult, but the support of open research and innovation labs in a real environment and directly connected to the citizens. And I think this is also something that um, my previous colleague was referring to. So this is something that we have been pursuing and I think that it is very important for the industry and research to empower innovation with prototypes, with products being developed according to the client's feedback in their environment and right from the start. So these innovation labs directly with citizens, I think they are very, very important for this innovation. Thank you very much, Susanna. Now I'd like to turn to another topic, which Commissioner Gabriel already has spoken very passionately about, which is the one of women entrepreneurship, a priority that EIT has been championing in recent years um, at all the levels, actually. We, we have supported that at the board of EIT and governing of KICS. Um, we have been training young women in digital skills under the European Commission's Digital Education Action Plan, supporting female entrepreneurs through the knowledge and innovation communities, but also with very practical steps like ensuring gender balance of experts and panels. So from your perspective, and maybe we can start with Kirsten and then also hear from Susanna, um, what do you think are really the most concrete measures 
that EIT could take that would make a difference for, for women entrepreneurs and innovators? I think um, we know that this is one of the key challenges that we face and key opportunities. The situation is certainly not uniform. We have in our, for example, for, for Climate Kick alone, we have a couple of markets where we have a very, very strong uh, gender representation from women. In fact, it's a majority rather than a minority. In others, it's very different. Um, so all in all, uh, we know that the, the situation broadly is, is undercooked. We need, we need a lot more from, from the possibility of women building businesses and carrying them through. We see that education is absolutely critical. Um, but also the design of engagements on innovation. And I think looking forward, there are huge opportunities that derive from the needs, a change in the needs we have for how to address some of the societal challenges that we're wrangling with that may and, and look like they might be opening up new opportunities. And I'm making these comments based on the work that we've been doing to do a gender mainstreaming assessment across some of our key, key programs. Um, to work with UN Women, supporting a, a developing a toolkit to look at the accelerators, uh, both in our case the Climate Launchpad and the Climate Accelerators, but we know that this is part of the world of the kicks generally in seeking to understand diagnostically what might the barriers be, build much stronger vision and story and narrative that encourages women to think about possibility and think about the possibilities rather than the obstacles first. Um, build capabilities in education. And if I come back to this question around the design, uh, increasingly to operate in more cross-disciplinary, uh, cross-functional collaborations and ecosystem design, where there are greater possibilities for some of the diversities of strength and skill to be demanded and pulled together in solutions design. So the greater emphasis on systemic approaches, a greater emphasis on social cohesion, on bringing together the social and cultural aspects of some of the elements of change that we know need to be addressed through technology and through innovations, opens the door to industries and to department to, to deployment of work where women have traditionally dominated and starts to bring a much more deliberate cross-pollination uh, into entrepreneurship and into innovation development. So it's partly a question of building a stronger vision for possibility, partly a question of education, skill building capability, um, partly an acknowledgement at the moment of the impact of COVID in the last two years of really denting some of the progress that was coming through because of the impact of in-home care and childcare. And so recuperating that and building forward better on some of those learnings into a redesign of the way in innovation initiatives, for example, like the new European Bauhaus deliberately brings together disciplines and areas of work that bring in both gender strengths um, and some of the traditional areas of gender practice and behavior. Hello. So, um... Yeah, so uh, let me let me just uh, address a bit of my experience. So when I was um, doing this work on vehicular networks and I was thinking, so this is something different that does not exist and it would be interesting to to fund to fund and and and, and start a company i was uh, a bit afraid a bit afraid because i didn't know how to do it so sometimes that's the the problem so we need to to have knowledge uh, we need to have information and we need to have support okay so through the these years and we start in 2012 now it's nine years later I think that the, the support uh, we can get and the support that EIT can give is very, very important. And how is this support? As Kirsten said, so the support on education, I think it's very important to use education to mentor uh, women and also <laughs> not only women, but, but to be able to also mentoring women that they will be able to, to go forward and they be able to, to, to be able to plan and to lead a, a company. And I think that the role, the role modeling is also very important. So you are not the first. There are many as you that started 
their lives were like this, and you will be able to 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 join and follow uh, the same part, the same um, the the same path. I think this is very very important. So the knowledge in education and knowledge in the support. So for how women, so if a, if a woman wants to start a company, how does she do it? What, uh, what she will need to be able to start. And thinking about COVID, so COVID, it may have um, problems uh, in, the, in the beginning, but COVID is, uh, started and is a cause of a crisis. And we know that when we have a crisis, we also have challenges. We also have opportunities, and we also have then a boom of new ideas, a boom of companies. And I have to tell you that when uh, I started this company, Portugal was in crisis. And actually, this was one uh, of the, the reasons that made us, we are professors in university, but we need to do more because we are in crisis, so we need to do, to do more. And to do more for us and to do more for our students that were uh, working with us and that wanted to to really um, go 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 forward. We knew that we could do it in Portugal. So let's look into the COVID and into this crisis as opportunities, as opportunities to, to do something that uh, was never done before. Let me just give you a, an example that actually happened happened to me too. So I was working and uh, with a company um, trying to develop the best communication strategy with access points at home so to trying to provide the best connection of access points at home so it wasn't something interesting for the normal people but then people started to go home for working their kids went home also to have remote classes people needed to have internet access in all the places at home and then i was being asked and this company was being asked for to have these equipments ready right on the time because they needed to have this internet access all uh, at all the parts of the home so there are many many opportunities so let's support now very specifically women also men but very specifically women because we know that this is a great time to get uh, new ideas and to get new uh, opportunities for all of us Thank you very much, um, Susanna and Kirsten. Clearly, we are in a period of creative destruction. And thank you very much for sharing your, your insights. Um, that's also the questions from my side. We still have a short time for Q&A. So I would like to thank you very much and pass back to Lars to see if there are any questions from the audience. Lars, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And thank you for the speakers, Kirsten and Susanna. Uh, so, uh, there are some questions, so I would like, the first question is for Joya, and the question is from, let me see who wrote the question, it's from Alexandra Metzibrotsky, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name right, so the question is the following, uh, some funding frameworks like Horizon 2020 have actually contributed to increasing the R&I divide between Western and Eastern Europe. Uh, how does the new EAT strategy aim to address overcome this issue? So the, the, the changes that have happened. Any comment? Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, and, uh, um, you know, part uh, of the Horizon Europe strategy is exactly that uh, of closing this innovation gap and divide. And this will be done uh, with uh, uh, focused uh, investments in uh, uh, regions and area that have uh, uh, a low uh, innovation score and index because we are now able to measure that uh, making sure that we do create uh, a, as we were describing earlier innovation ecosystems exactly in those areas so by putting you know uh, hubs there that will have not only research which is the topic you raised but also education so uh, you know a pipeline of uh, people who can do research and entrepreneurship and then um, actual business expertise 
mentorship and financial capital uh, for innovation to thrive. This has been uh, um, discussed uh, at length. It's uh, the will of uh, uh, the EU. It's been put uh, down in paper in our strategy and uh, uh, we were working on this before, but now we have uh, higher uh, means um, to effect uh, a change in this direction. Thank you very much, Joya. So uh, I have another question, and this question is for Kirsten. Uh, so Kirsten, it's a question about uh, unicorns. And the question is principally uh, saying that um, um, uh, how I mean the 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 unicorns how how are they important for our economy for I mean it's of course important for the company they bring millions of investments right but how is that important for the European economy so to say I think the key um, the key element is that unicorns are have a magnetic force they create around them and with them and a market, market making dynamic that draws through a whole set of other innovations that can then build, that can partner, that can form uh, variations and permutations around the entire ecosystem. So it's really, I think, I think many of the societal challenges that we face would um, be well addressed by the by creating the competitive conditions for very large scale in and fast moving meteor effects, particularly say in digital uh, digital technologies. Um, others probably need um, something where particularly where we've got elements of social justice and social cohesion, a different kind of model. We need both. Um, probably one of the, the the reason why this is a discourse that matters for Europe and matters for innovators in the IT communities is the extent to which unicorns create a wake and they create and they pull through investment at orders of magnitude that Europe's currently doesn't have sufficient of. So that kind of element of large above system investment and above system attention would really help us move forward in exponential leaps. And that's a significant part of the reason why investing in innovation ecosystems in sustained ways over time helps build that sort of momentum. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Uh, we have one more question here, and this time it's to, for Martin, and it's from Polina Toropova. You spoke about the uh, silos, actions to remove silos, but can you explain a bit more what, what can be done in order to remove the, the, silo, the silos that exist in, in well, in parts of the innovation system, can you please? Yes, so silos exist at all the levels, and I think that's why we need to tackle them at, at all the levels. So, for example, between our knowledge and innovation communities, we created some years ago the opportunity for cross-kick cooperation, as we call it, meaning, you know, concrete tools to work together on, on cross-cutting issues, such as, for example, artificial intelligence, where many of our innovation communities have startups that they support, and there's obviously a lot of value to getting them together and have an exchange. It can also be in, in terms of physical locations, as, as EIT is all over Europe, and of course, in countries where there are several knowledge and innovation communities, there's a lot um, to be gained by, by working together. But it, of course, can also be across the whole EU um, research and innovation landscape, so we are particularly happy that already in January we concluded a cooperation agreement, memorandum of understanding with the European Innovation Council. We are preparing um, something similar with, with other programs so that um, for the individual, for the innovator, for the student, for the researcher, the EU research and innovation landscape becomes a whole and, and they don't have to, to find their way through the different you know, labyrinth of, of accessing them, but they can be referred to the, by the different programs to each other so that we can you know, strengthen and accelerate the innovation projects and, and get more success stories coming out of research into, into the innovation. I think one of the biggest steps that was done to, to break down the silos is to fully integrate the EIT in Horizon Europe in, in Pillar 3 and with the other innovation programs. So also there, um, there's a lot to be done to make that work in practice, but the framework is now in place. Thank you very much, Martin. 
So we are running out of, of time for this uh, first uh, session of the uh, ERT launch event today. So I would like to say a big thank you to all of you that participated and just uh, some, I think some small um, take home messages. I think what we have been witnessing and talking about is a lot about the really big importance that ERT brings to Europe with the possibilities for in, an inclusive Europe and decreasing silos, as you pointed out, Martin, very importantly, and also to increase the innovation power and empower citizens or people to take part of the innovation, let's call it the innovation journey that is ahead of us. And what you, I think, Susanna, mentioned very well is about the taking the opportunities that are out there, right? Because there are plenty of opportunities and we need to identify them. And then I think we have the ERT system that will support us to take our journey into the innovation landscape. So thank you very much, everyone. And I am now happy to leave over the panel to the next panel, which will be a session that is named the following, if you bear with me one second. I just found my mouse. Yeah, this is the ERT's contribution to a green and digital European economy. So thank you again to everyone in this first panel. Thank you so much. Bye. Mm -hmm.